How's it going? Good, man. How are you? Thanks for doing this. You were there. Can you believe it's 20 years later? Somebody else asked me about it recently, and I said, uh, do you ever talk about it? I said, I'll talk about it once in a blue moon. All the people you grew up with, went to school with. You can only hope that fate dealt them all good cards. But for a few, fate will have a test. A special job for the strong. We all got dressed in our, in our official uh, cert uniform, so it's all BDU, black BDUs. It says Nassau County Sheriff's Department on a, on a one patch. It says cert on it and putting your gun belt on and, and getting ready to go in there. And it was everybody wasn't like psyched to go, but it was a feeling of necessity, I guess. Like, we're going to go in there and we're going to help. <laughs> World Gym right on the corner, right across from the West Side Highway there. And we walked through the blown out windows of World Gym. Everything was frozen in time. You saw people's water bottles still in the, in the treadmills. We had to walk through the windows because there was no doorways to get in. Everything was just blown out. And the only recognizable thing on the street walking to the World Trade Center site was the brass handrails. We saw the very tip of it in a debris field. And I saw the top of a light post. That's how deep the debris was to walk into the site itself. And once we got on site, we started making our way up to the tippity tippity top. And we were on what they call bucket brigade. And we were just handing down buckets of debris because you couldn't get heavy machinery in there. Buckets and buckets and buckets of debris. And all of a sudden, it would stop. Everything would go silent. And all of a sudden, a body bag would come down. And we're passed the body bag down over our heads. And some body bags were really heavy, and some were very, very, very light. So you, you knew that there was just parts in there. One of the Rikers Island correction officers is telling me, whatever you do, if you pick up body parts, just make sure the gloves that you're wearing, you discard them and we'll give you another pair. And that stuck to my brain like a little, I said, like, wow, this is on, this is real. Yeah. Um, you smell death everywhere you, I mean, where you walked them out there, it was death. I want to ask you about that specifically because I'm 15 miles away. For the first two weeks, we couldn't smell anything because the wind was blowing in the other direction. And then for one or two days, it blew this way. It was overwhelmingly toxic. It didn't smell like a wood fire uh, when people oh, no. think of a fire. It smelled to me like caustic insulation, cancer-causing... I mean, that's 15 miles away. What was it like there? You were smelling molten metal. You were smelling burning cables. You were smelling burning bodies, gasoline, diesel fuel. You can't believe what you're seeing. And then the smells, you know, okay. Once in a while, I'll, I'll be outside and I'll smell the death smell. That's the, that brings you right, that brings me right back to the site. And I kind of go somewhere for a second. That brings me right back there. My wife and I both grew up in New York. As a kid on Long Island, I'd take the train in to the tallest building in the city, the Empire State Building, where the views were all around second to none. Put in a quarter, and you could watch these new twin towers going up down by the battery. It took years to build them, really captured my imagination. The new tallest in New York, and there would be two of them, twins. I couldn't wait to see what the view would be like from up there. Over the years, they ended up in a lot of our photos and Super 8 movies. Look at that watch. Once a guy climbed from the sidewalk on the outside all the way to the top, George Willig. The cops were there for him on the roof. Philippe Petit didn't just dangle over Manhattan on the railing. He strung a cable and tight ropes between the towers. Police were also there to greet him, but it was cool. I think it was right before New Year's, and my dad took us to the World Trade Center as a special treat to go to dinner at Windows on the World. And I had never been close to the building. I'd only seen it from a distance. Um, I didn't know anything about the restaurant, but we were pretty excited to go. And when we got to the elevator, I still remember the wind was blowing so hard. The elevator was just shaking like crazy all the way up. And there was an elevator operator in there who assured us that everything was fine and this goes on all day in the winter. To be honest, I don't even remember what we ate, but I do remember the view and I do remember you know, taking a lot of time 
time to walk around up there and uh, asking people what it was like to work up there every day. And, you know, it was just one of those things that was just really fascinating. And it's my only memory of the building. It was a special place. We went in there and we were psyched because we had all kinds of specialty training. Rappelled down into 30 feet deep, seeing if there was life. And every turn, there's no life. And all of a sudden, you would hear horns go off when you're on site. And that the horns were a signal for everybody, machinery and everybody to be quiet because they thought they heard something. Then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, you hear the machine start up again and people start talking. It was just, they didn't hear anything. And you, you had that hope that you were going to see somebody pulled out of that rubble alive or find a pocket of people that were alive. And the more you were there and the more death you kept on seeing around you, the more depressed that you got. That was a tough thing to swallow. Here on Long Island, they knew residents weren't coming back by the cars left in the commuter parking lots of the train stations. It was like this in almost every town. Chief John Paolillo of Battalion 11 was my neighbor at the time. He lived three houses down. The guy was so dedicated to his job, he brought firefighting manuals with him on vacation and read them on the beach. We don't think enough about the dedication that a lot of these rescue workers have. John arrived on the scene a few minutes before the second plane hit. He was in such good shape, he was already between the 30th and 40th floors when the other tower collapsed. The man he was with made it out, but John didn't. The town put up a sign naming this street after him. 20 years later, that sign is gone. John's brother, New York Police Detective Joseph, spent weeks digging at Ground Zero looking for his brother. Two years ago, Joe was killed by a rare form of 9-11 related cancer. There are so many stories like this, so many very good people. The attack 20 years later is still taking lives. Two guys that I know that were friends of mine are dead from 9-11 related cancers from being at that site. All of us that were at that site are waiting for the ball to drop. Well, now something else is going to hit us, you know? It's the toxins that were there. So, you know, people don't really realize that the toxins that were there were deadly. And that's asbestos and, uh, and concrete yeah, and all concrete. sorts of things. I mean, Jimmy, the only recognizable thing that I saw from an office building was the the top of a keyboard from a computer. You know, like just the where the keys would be in. I picked that up and I'm going, oh my God, it's just this one piece. There's nothing but dust that I'm standing on. How many people, I'm saying to myself, how many people am I, am, am I standing, standing on people's ashes right now? I'm going to tell you something, Jim. I did not want to be there that day. I have not been back to that site since the time that we were there. The first time that I ever stepped foot in any type of memorial was at the 9-11 concert two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Uh, they brought in a, uh, a mobile 9-11 museum. So I walked out and I say, I have to do this. I have to go into this museum. And I didn't want anybody with me. I wanted to do it alone. I was walking around, looking at the images. It brought me back and I just cried. Just so many emotions. The new building has been built. It stands 1776 feet tall. The elevator ride makes it look like you're seeing the city transform from a settlement to the present time. And now, we invite you to enter One World Observatory through the doors on your right, where a spectacular 360 degree view of the city awaits directly below you. The incredible views are back. Here I am looking at the Empire State Building where I used those binoculars, looking back from a building that's no longer there from its replacement building. I missed these for 20 years. Also built on the site is something they call the Oculus. The price tag for this unique structure, the Oculus, was $4 billion. Two giant memorial fountains symbolize where the Twin Towers used to stand. It sure has changed since the rescue workers were in this exact spot in the dirt.
This isn't about the buildings. This is about the people. About the workers who train so hard to do impossible things and their rescue animals. And we don't even have a clue about how they sacrifice, how professional they are, how special their families have to be. How special their families have to be. By the way, those little dots in the middle of the blue lights? Birds. This isn't about the buildings. This is about what heroes look like. <laughs>